snapped your neck, you're dead. You're dead, I snapped your neck. <sighs> See this? I just snapped her neck, she's dead. Nope, you're, you're not, oh. You, you knocked my, oh, would you st okay, you stop kicking me. You're not gonna get that, okay? You just stop kicking me. I'm gonna punch you right in the face, girl. Okay, you're back. So, I just snapped your neck. Let's give a quick recap to the people at home who didn't see it. You were smelling the, you were smelling my ice in my cup. So I had to reach over and go, huh? So what's it like in the afterlife? Okay. Nothing? Oh, you're lucky you're cute. Okay. Oh, you stop kicking me. You look at the camera. You stop kicking me. Stop kicking me. Alright. Now you're, you and your sister can smell each other to see that you didn't get anything. <clears throat> oh, I'm going to beat my dogs up. <laughs> what <are> you... <laughs> okay, so this was a request. <laughs> Video time. So this is a request. Um, it's the Chinese pirate who fought European colonization. Um, Aksinga. Oh, the K was covered. So yeah, you get it. So we'll just do the video. I'll try to get out of pronouncing anything incorrectly. It is the year 1661, and... Kuxinga. The sun rises over the tropical coastline of Ila Formosa. In this most far-flung outpost of the Dutch Empire lies the coastal Fort Zelandia, where a watchman gazes sleepily through the morning fog. That looks like a turkey. Th those ships look like some kind of bird like that's the head that's the neck and then that's like the feathers and sorry as the mists fade he spots a massive approaching fleet of Chinese junks all united under one man the pirate king of southern China welcome to our video on the house of Zheng a dynasty of sea lords who fought European and Chinese empires alike to become the undisputed masters of the East Asian seas at the turn of the 17th century, the Asian world was one defined by a contrast of cloistered empires and new intrepid adventurers. China, ruled by the Ming emperors, had been closed off to the world for nearly 200 years. Foreigners were rarely allowed in, and the Chinese officially weren't allowed out. To the east, equally isolationist Japan had recently been united under the Tokugawa shogunate. By the 1540s, explorers from Europe had arrived in Asia, seeking the wealth of the Orient. The Chinese and Japanese generally saw these strangers as uncouth barbarians, but due to their sailing prowess and firearms, the Christians soon asserted themselves as intermediaries in international trade. By 1580, the Spanish and Portuguese had established footholds in Manila, Macau and Hirado, port cities that grew into wealthy centers of commerce and attracted ambitious entrepreneurs from all over the world. Perhaps the most prominent of these entrepreneurs were the representatives of the Hoklo people. Sailing from the isolated southern province of Fujian, these skilled Chinese sailors regularly defied the isolationist policy of Beijing. Prominent communities of Hoklo traders lived in Chinatowns throughout Asia, while Chinese pirates plied the sea lanes from Malacca to Nagasaki, preying on unprotected merchant ships. Of all the corsairs on the South China Sea, the greatest was a man known as Zheng Jilong. Born in 1604 to a wealthy family in Fujian, he was exiled from his home for delinquency and travelled to Macau, China's seedy window into the outside world. There he was baptised by the Jesuits and learned much of European culture. Before long, the ambitious Hoklo found work aboard a trader. In Nagasaki, 
Jilong was adopted by a wealthy Chinese magnate and inherited his fleet of ships when the merchant died. Meanwhile, the Dutch, headed by their national megacorporation, the East India Company, were ready to make their claim on the spices of the New World. Thanks to the efforts of a certain English samurai, William Adams, the Protestants had established a factory in Hirado in 1609, and now sought to get a foothold in China while ousting their Spanish and Portuguese rivals. Zheng Jilong, however, looked upon these foreigners and saw an opportunity. As both he and the Dutch spoke Portuguese, he worked his way into their trust as a translator and helped the East India Company create a base in Taiwan. The Dutch soon realized that this bold young Hoklo at the head of a vast fleet of ships could be a valuable asset to them. Geelong was quickly offered a position as a privateer of the Dutch East India Company. It was a simple arrangement. He would be provided with European muskets and cannons, and in return, he was to raid Chinese shores, thereby pressuring the Ming court to open trade with the Dutch. Never one for scruples, Geelong was quick to accept and his fleet of lightly armed Chinese junks were quickly converted into high-powered warships. Geelong soon proved to be an incredibly capable admiral. Hoisting the Dutch flag, he and his ships ravaged the Chinese coastline with impunity. His renown quickly grew, and soon freebooters and fortune seekers from across Asia had joined his fleet. By 1627, the Hoklo Sea Lord commanded 400 junks, crewed by Fujinese pirates, Japanese samurai, European mercenaries, and even African musketeers, former Portuguese slaves that now served as freedmen alongside their Chinese commander. By 1628, Geelong had either eliminated all the other major Chinese pirate fleets or consolidated them into his own. Naturally, the Ming sent their own navy after the upstart Corsair, but centuries of isolation had left their naval prowess lacking and the Hoklo Sea Lord blew the ineffective imperial ships out of the water. Before long, Zheng Jilong was the undisputed greatest power in the South China Sea. It was quickly becoming evident to Jilong that he no longer needed the Dutch. After all, why work for some barbarians on the edge of the world when you can be legitimized by the Emperor of China himself? Switching allegiances, he surrendered to the Ming Dynasty. It was an offer the beleaguered court in Beijing was unable to refuse. This upstart pirate had already effectively seized control of their entire southern coastline. Better he work for them, they thought, than for the Dutch. The Hoklo Sea Lord was appointed Admiral of the Coastal Seas by the Chongzhen Emperor, rendering him no longer a criminal of China, but one of its most powerful lords. Of course, the Dutch were none too happy about their most valuable asset turning against them. Deeming that Geelong was a traitor, they deployed a fleet of warships to eliminate him. Under normal circumstances, Chinese junks were no match for a European warship, but Geelong was savvy to the ways of Western warfare. He soundly defeated the Dutch in 1633 at the Battle of Liaolo Bay. To the Chinese, this triumph was a miracle at sea with one Ming bureaucrat grimly remarking, ever since the Red Barbarians arrived, this kind of victory has been extremely rare. Be that as it may, there was no mistaking it. An up-jumped Hoklo pirate was now the undisputed master of the East Asian seas. For a time, Geelong ruled a vast maritime empire alongside his kinsmen, dominating nearly all sea-bound trade from Manila to Nagasaki. But prosperity was not to last, and dark clouds loomed on the horizon for the House of Zheng. For decades, the men just uh, I was talking to my dogs, by the way, I had to mute the mic because they're just staring at me. For decades, the Manchu people had been fighting a bloody war against the Ming in the far northeast of China. In 1644, they took advantage of a peasant revolt to storm out of their ancestral homeland and capture the imperial capital of Beijing. The peoples of southern China resented the idea of Manchu domination. To them, the northerners were crass barbarians, 
and under their rule, ethnic Chinese were forced to shave their heads into a Manchu queue, a humiliating act of submission that betrayed their deep Confucian values. For Zheng Jilong, the path was clear, and he declared his support for the Ming resistance. It was a dire situation. The Ming Emperor had committed suicide, while both the northern and southern capitals of Beijing and Nanjing were in the hands of the Manchu, whose Qing dynasty now controlled two-thirds of China. The south needed a new figurehead to rally around, so Jilong found an imperial prince hiding in Hangzhou and escorted him to Fujian. There he was coronated as Longwu, Emperor of the Southern Ming, a rump state with the city of Fuzhou as its capital. For a time, the Zheng clan was able to use the natural defensive choke points of their domain to protect their imperial ward, but before long, crippling food shortages and famine had laid the province low. Spread too thin to defend the hinterlands, Zheng Jilong withdrew his troops from the mountain passes and retreated to his coastal enclaves. As a result, the Manchus were able to march into Fujian and occupy Fuzhou. The Longwu pretender fled westwards, but was captured in the mountains and put to death. Recognizing where the wind was blowing, the Zheng Patriarch renounced his loyalty to the Ming and made overtures of diplomacy to the Qing. In 1646, he attended a banquet hosted by a Manchu commander, with only his special honor guard of African musketeers as protection. Originally willing to cut a deal with Jilong, the Manchus soon changed their mind and had the Sea Lord arrested. As the story goes, his African vanguard fought to protect the Patriarch's liberty, dying to the last man while trying in vain to prevent the seizure of their lord. With Jilong imprisoned, anyone could have been forgiven for assuming the Zheng clique would collapse like a deck of cards. But this was not to be, as one Zheng Sen rose from the shadows. Born in Hirado in 1624, the boy was the product of union between Zheng Jilong and a Japanese woman. He had moved to Fujian as a young child, and had been trained his whole life to one day rule the Zheng's maritime empire. To his people, he was known as Kokshinga, lord of the imperial surname. Unlike his father, he remained fiercely loyal to the Ming. Manchu forces had burnt down his family manor and captured his beloved mother, humiliating her until the proud Japanese woman was compelled to commit seppuku. Driven by his personal honor and desire for vengeance, Kokshinga resolved to continue the fight against the Qing, whatever the cost. At only 22 years old, Kokshinga had eliminated several scheming relatives and become the undisputed head of his clan. From his fortress at Ansai, he rapidly reconsolidated the Zheng fleet. By 1650, he had hundreds of war junks at his disposal, along with 40,000 soldiers, comprised of Ming loyalists, Japanese samurai, and African gunners inherited from his father. For the next 10 years, Kokshinga led his forces in a dogged struggle against the Qing, at times managing to seize land, and at times being pushed back to the sea. In Guangzhou, a new prince had been crowned as the sovereign of the Ming. While Kokshinga pledged his loyalty to this new Yongli emperor, the young sea lord's struggle against the Manchus was really its own isolated theater of war. I'm just going to pause real fast to apologize for not pausing, but I don't know anything about this story. And so I feel like I'm just watching it like I normally would. And I know some people are saying, well, keep watching, stupid, if you don't have anything to contribute. Well, I'm supposed to pause it every now and then and just add my thoughts. And my thoughts are, I, I don't know anything about this, and it's great. And that is my two cents. Back to the video. The campaign began strongly. In 1651, Zheng troops struck like lightning, expelling the Qing out of Zhengzhou and Quanzhou. Koxinger himself led the charge in land, with stories claiming that due to his Japanese heritage, he fought with the ferocity and martial discipline of a samurai lord. By 1652, his vast navy had fanned out and established control over a 1,300-kilometer strip of coastline, stretching from Zhejiang to Guangdong, while his control of rich sea lanes from Japan to Vietnam kept his soldiers paid and fed. 
Taken aback by this stunning string of defeats, the Qing were forced to bring Kokshinga to the bargaining table. In 1653, they wheeled out their prized hostage, Zheng Jilong. The old patriarch implored his son to capitulate just like he did, but Kokshinga was undeterred. He spurned his father's pleas and left him to his fate. Thus, in 1654, war resumed. In 1656, I don't know why you'd want to capitulate anyways. I think the father was wrong on that one. But the father is just doing everything he can to probably bring the family back together. And he doesn't want the son to be killed. In 1656, the Manchu Prince Jidu sailed down the south coast at the head of a massive fleet. I'm going to replay that just to make sure that I'm... Not about to laugh. Resumed. In 1656, the Manchu Prince Jidu sailed down the south coast. The Manchu Prince Dudu, that's what I heard. <laughs> I'm I'm kinda tired. And now Prince Dudu's on the on the attack. I just don't know what's happening anymore, but I'm loving it. Prince Dudu. I know that's not what they said, I'm sure. Post at the head of a massive fleet to confront Kokshinger in open battle. The wily sea lord pro <laughs> So Prince Dudu, he's about to go after Coxinger. <laughs> so Cox and Dudu are about to go at it. Proved a tough opponent on his home turf, burning down the capital cities of Zhengzhou and Guangzhou and scorching the countryside to starve his enemy before utterly destroying the beleaguered Qing fleet off the Kinmen Islands. With the Manchus now direly short on ships, Kokshinga crossed his own personal Rubicon and in 1659 launched a full-scale campaign to retake the imperial southern capital. The offensive started out strong, with Zheng forces sailing down the Yangtze River and seizing the fortified towns of Guizhou and Zhengjiang. By August, their army of 85,000 was at the gates of Nanjing itself. Much of Manchu-occupied China watched with bated breath, ready to rise up should Kokshinger reign victorious. And yet, it was not to be. Although he had Nanjing on the ropes, the Sea Lord did not attack immediately, instead giving the Qing garrison a two-week grace period to surrender themselves, during which time he entertained his troops with glamorous festivities. This gave the Qing time to call for reinforcements, launch a fierce counter-strike into Kokchinger's army, and force him to retreat. The failed siege of Nanjing was a turning point for Kokchinger's fortunes on the mainland. He'd lost his momentum, while in the east, the other pocket of Ming resistance was smashed when the Yongli pretender suffered a crushing defeat and was forced to flee to Myanmar. This meant that the Zheng clan stood completely alone against the full, undiverted might of the Qing army. Kokshinger knew that holding the mainland was now becoming more and more unlikely, and that in order for his maritime dynasty to survive, he would need to relocate to a more secure base. For that, he looked eastward to Taiwan. In the eyes of the Chinese emperors, Taiwan had long been an island that existed beyond the boundaries of civilization. The principal inhabitants of the land were the native aborigines, the ancestral cousins of the Malay and Filipino people. They had inhabited Taiwan for thousands of years. Living along the coastline was a small community of Chinese hoklos, numbering about 50,000 Many of them had migrated to the island to avoid the ongoing war in China. It was the Dutch East India Company, however, who were the masters of the island, ruling from their power bases of Fort Provincia and Fort Zeelandia. Capitalists before all, Taiwan generated the company a tidy profit, and they were unlikely to give the island up without a fight. Nevertheless, the Hollanders proved to be despotic rulers, for the Chinese were taxed heavily while the Aborigines were subject to exploitation and Christian assimilation. 
the arrival of the great fleet of Zheng would be a spark upon an island ready to erupt into chaos. On April 30th, 1661, Kuxinger came upon the west coast of Taiwan at the head of 400 junks with 25,000 men. They docked in the Lerman Peninsula, where the local Chinese settlers greeted Kuxinger with delirious joy, rushing to help the army make landfall. The Dutch garrison numbered only 1,140 soldiers and eight warships, led by Governor Frederick Coyet. Being so direly outnumbered did not render their situation hopeless. European weapons were still far superior to Chinese ones, and in their eyes, one Dutchman with a musket was worth 100 Chinese armed with spears. Indeed, Kuxinger's forces lacked modern firepower, with only his Africans having access to European rifles. In order to prevent the rest of his army from landing, Governor Coyette deployed four of his eight warships, led by the flagship Hector. In response, Kokshinger dispatched 60 junks to engage. For a while, European firepower reigned supreme, with Hector alone blowing eight junks to smithereens and forcing the rest to scatter. But in an unfortunate twist, a lit fuse hit the ship's gunpowder magazine, causing it to explode and the other ships to flee. Oh, oh, oh. landed the rest of his troops unopposed. At the head of a 4,000-man vanguard, the Admiral advanced upon Fort Zelandia, where he was accosted en route by a contingent of 200 and... How common was it that an accident like that would happen where a fuse got lit and it, and it blew up? And, and I don't mean... Okay. I don't mean like, uh, like, so they're, <coughs> excuse me. I don't mean like uh, two ships are, are lined up, you know, they're, they're shooting at each other. A uh, 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 ball penetrates the, the side of the ship and sets off the gunpowder or something like that. Just where that was just a freak accident. I guess the freak accident part should probably tell me it didn't happen a whole lot. But, um, or maybe I'm saying freak accident and it's something that actually happened quite a bit more than you would be comfortable admitting kind of thing. If you're, uh, if you're somebody who would know or... And you don't have to say, it's happened 1,641 times, and the casualty list would be 10,000. Yeah, I don't need that. Because if you know that, you've done you've done a lot of research on this type of thing. But in general, and I know you're not going to have the exact number, but, you know, is it... I don't want to say was it something they had to worry about, because clearly you're going to have to worry about it, but... On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being you had to be damn sure that that didn't happen because it could or, you know, one where one out of every 500 ships might have a, a freak accident like that. The ship might go down, it might have sustained some damage, but it could still be fixed. Sorry. It just... 40 Dutch gunmen. The Chinese were able to negate their enemy's firepower by outflanking the musketeers, killing half of them. The island natives, meanwhile, defected en masse to Kokshinger. They burned their Christian school books and struck out in their tribal war parties, hunting and beheading any of their former colonial masters they could find outside their fortress walls. Following these setbacks, the Dutch attempted to reason with their foe. They and Kokshinger had been functioning business partners prior to this, and it had been the Chinese admiral's father who helped them settle on Taiwan in the first place, so why attack now? The Sea Lord replied, Hitherto this island had always belonged to China, and the Dutch had doubtless been permitted to live there, seeing that the Chinese did not require it for themselves. But requiring it now, it was only fair that Dutch strangers who came from far regions should give way to the masters of the island. Kokshinger gave the garrison at Zelandia a choice. If they flew his flag over the fort, he would accept their surrender and allow them to sail to Batavia unharmed. 
if they wished for war, then they were to fly a red flag. Meanwhile, the Chinese had encircled Fort Provincia. Lacking in fresh water, the Dutch commander there surrendered. Kokshinger ruthlessly ordered the men in the fort executed and the women taken to become concubines for his officers. He hoped this would terrify the garrison in Zelandia into quickly giving up. See, now that just makes me want to... I, I would I would go all out, all out full-on war and I would go so far as... Yeah, I would be crossing the line, that's all I'll say. Inversely, this did little but steal Dutch resolve. On the morning of May... Sorry, I have a thing of, of shuffling cards. I just... I don't know why. I've done it since I was like 16. I just shuffle. Always do. And back to the video. On the morning of May the 4th, a red flag flew over Zealandia. The Hollanders were ready to make their last stand. On May 25th, an overconfident Kokshinger launched a full-scale assault on Fort Zealandia. This was a mistake. Well entrenched in their walls, the Dutch decimated the exposed Chinese with their muskets and artillery, killing over a thousand while losing only three men in the defense. Realizing his only real option was to wait them out, Kokshinger used his navy to cut off Zelandia's access to the sea, then settled in for a long siege. The fort would hold out for ten months, during which time the Chinese army chafed. Running low on supplies, they resorted to plundering Aborigine lands for food, resulting in the tribes around Fort Provincia rising up against them, killing over 2,000 of Kokshinger's soldiers. Meanwhile, a fleet of 11 Dutch warships arrived from Batavia in August to reinforce their company comrades. Seeing no value in Taiwan and longing for home, many of Kokshinger's men secretly abandoned the siege and sailed back across the strait, forcing the Sea Lord to use violent discipline to keep his army in line. Slowly but surely, the tides began to turn once more. By autumn, Kokshinger had put down the Aborigine rebellions and re-secured their allegiance, while in September he fended off a two-pronged assault from the fortress garrison and their naval reinforcements. His junks performed a false retreat maneuver to lure the Dutch ships into narrow waters where they were sunk, captured or forced to flee. On the landward side, skilled Chinese archers and deadly African gunners kept their foe pinned against the fortress walls. The coup de grace came in January of 1662, when a German defector entered the Chinese camp and made Kokshinger aware of a strategic redoubt that overlooked Zeelandia from atop a hill. Acting quickly, the Sea Lord ordered his men to storm the redoubt, which they did in due order. With the Dutch now completely exposed to Kokshinger's firepower from above, the fight was over. Governor Koyet offered his surrender on the 1st of February. He and his men were allowed to take their personal belongings and leave the island in safety. On the 17th of February, the Dutchmen marched out of their fort in full regalia, boarding their ships and sailing to Batavia. European colonialism in Taiwan had officially ended. For Kokshinger, Taiwan was always meant to be a temporary base from where he could strike back to retake the mainland. However, he was shrewd enough to realize that in the short term, this was impossible. So, instead of reigniting war with the Qing, he set to building a new society on his island. He established a system of government that modeled the imperial Ming court, while migrants from the mainland flooded onto the island, fleeing Qing persecution. Taiwan, a region long considered a barbarian backwater to the ethnic Han, quickly developed into the most prominent haven of Chinese culture untouched by Manchu rule. Kokshinger's crowning achievement would also be his last. Three months after expelling the Dutch, he became infected with malaria. Unable to cope with the disease in Taiwan's tropical climate, <clears throat> he died on the 23rd of June 1662 at 37 years old. His son, Zheng Jing, succeeded the legendary sea lord. 
he reconstituted his Taiwanese domain as the independent kingdom of Tung Ning, and for 20 years maintained its liberty against both Dutch and Manchu invasions. It would be under his weaker, illegitimate child, Zheng Kushuang, that Taiwan finally fell to the Qing in 1683, ending nearly a century of the House of Zheng's domination over the South China Sea. People across the Chinese-speaking world honor the memory of the House of Zheng and their greatest patriarch for their own differing reasons. The Taiwanese people look upon Kokshinga as their cultural forefather, with a reverence bordering on godhood. His resistance against the mainland is often compared with their own separate identity from the modern People's Republic of China. In China itself, the Zhengs are hailed as true patriots, whose noble resistance against the Manchu and European foreigners alike rendered them heroes to their people, while their ultimately failed desire to reconquer the mainland from their island base serves as an echo to the contemporary goal of political unity between the two nations on either side of the Taiwan Strait. Indeed, while the reign of these ambitious sea lords was relatively short in the grand scheme of Chinese history, they will live on in the social memory of millions of people for many years to come. We have more videos on Chinese history on the web. That was interesting. The only thing I didn't like was the killing of the people on the fort. And then the next fort does the red flag, but they let them all go. I would figure you're not going to execute the people who put up the white flag, but you would with the red flag. But I'm a 400 year past the incident armchair quarterback here. He had his reasons. All right. So we're going to end this here. I have a little thanks button on my channel. If you, just, you look down, you'll see it. You could donate to the channel. Anything is appreciated. Uh, if not, oh, I'm sorry. If you do donate, with your donation comes me, if you have requests. I move your request to the top. I get those done first. So I think it's a... Uh, it's my way of saying thank you. You get booted to the top. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you don't want to give any money or anything like that, no harm, no foul. Don't worry about it. I get it. It's tough times. Uh, but like and subscribe, that's free. That's that's literally just you moving this around and, and going click, click, click. And everyone's happy. 70% of the people who watch my videos aren't subscribed. So subscribe, what's the point? Come on. Come on. And after that, I'm going to end this video by saying have a good day, have a good night.